Well now, you may have been with us earlier in the programme when we heard from the Secretary of State for Scotland saying a second referendum on independence would not be held for Scotland. Well, let's put that straight away to the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who joins you now from Glasgow. Very good morning to you, First Minister. Good morning. Well, uh, you may have heard it loud and clear. I certainly did. You can talk all you like about a second independence referendum, but you're not getting one. Well, I, I didn't hear the Secretary of State earlier on, but um, you know the Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, he's the, the only Conservative MP in the whole of Scotland, and I, I think people across Scotland would probably raise an eyebrow at uh, that uh, sort of uh, dictatorial uh, attitude. If, if the Scottish Parliament chooses... Uh, to put that question again to the people of Scotland, then you know that is the right of the Scottish Parliament to do so. And, and when push came to shove, I, I don't think a, a Conservative Party, who, who of course have caused the circumstances in which this is being considered again, would in reality stand in the way of that. But you know, my focus just now is on trying to do everything I can to protect Scotland's interests in these circumstances, trying to work with others to avoid a hard Brexit for the whole UK, putting forward reasonable proposals that would help Scotland to stay in the single market, even if the rest of the UK leaves. Uh, but if all of that fails, then yes, I'm being very clear. I think the people of Scotland would have the right uh, at that point to decide whether they wanted to be taken out of the single market by the Conservative government or whether we wanted to opt uh, to pursue a different path. Mm. But isn't it all rather academic, First Minister, in that uh, the people of Scotland you know, can see all the facts in front of them right now and all the indications are if you held a second independence referendum... Mm. You'd lose, probably smash the SNP up. You'd probably have to resign. It would make David Cameron's decision to hold an EU referendum look prudent. Well, you know, none of that, I think, is, is the case. I mean, clearly, if there is uh, at some point another independence referendum, then, of course, we would, as a country, have to debate what we thought the best option and the best future was for us. But, of course, you know, the circumstances in which this question has been brought to the fore again is the circumstances of Brexit and, you know, continuing to be part of a UK that is determined against all economic considerations to leave the single market despite the damage that will do to the economy, to jobs, to living standards. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that when the reality of that starts to unfold uh, that that is something that people will want to do because the implications of that are very severe, not just for Scotland, of course, but for the whole UK. So this is a, about how we best protect Scottish interests. It's about how we best secure for ourselves the ability to build a stronger uh, and more secure future based on a, a sound economy uh, because continuing to, to go down a path that is taking us out of the single market is not going to help us do that. OK, I mean, you keep mentioning that, First Minister, the single market, and I noticed in your speech you said that again, that yes, indeed, uh, the UK has a mandate to leave the European Union, but no mandate to remove any parts of the UK from the single market. So therefore, reading between the lines there, are you saying that Scotland could stay within the UK as it exits the EU as long as it maintains access to that single market? Well, I, I've said we'll put forward proposals that would uh, enable that to happen because I, I am, you know, I'm seriously concerned, as I think everybody should be right now, that the UK, if it leaves the single market, is taking a, a step off a cliff edge. And I don't want Scotland to have to go over that cliff edge as well. So, yes, we'll put forward proposals over the, the next uh, few weeks and seek to have these proposals as part of the UK's Article 50 negotiating strategy that would allow Scotland to maintain its place in the single market and protect the jobs and the investment and the trade that all depend uh, on that relationship. Uh, if that is rejected by the UK government, then of course that, uh, the, the position that I'm putting forward is that Scotland would have the right then to consider whether to become independent. Mm. But I think the ball very much at the moment is in Theresa May's court. She says she values the UK, she says, and Scotland has repeatedly been told we're an equal partner in the UK. Well, it's time now to prove that, to prove that Scotland's voice can be heard and our interests can be protected in the UK. And All I right. hope that's a message Theresa May hears and responds to. Well, if you got that so-called soft Brexit, then presumably uh, you'd still be part of a UK. And we heard at the Conservative Party conference, didn't we, the other week, a UK that the Health Secretary wants to become self-sufficient, mm. uh, the NHS self-sufficient in British people and wants to institute a, a register of foreign nationals working yeah. for companies. Do you think uh, Scotland could opt out of those? 
Well, some of the extra powers that we would require to have in order to maintain our place in the single market if we were still part of the UK would be you know, powers such as, as immigration, greater flexibility over immigration. But there's, there is a bigger issue here, um, I think, which is about the kind of country we want to be. I, I will not be the only person uh, that was absolutely and utterly horrified at the language and the rhetoric that came out of the Conservative Party conference uh, last week. You know, we have people from other European countries living and working here in Scotland and other parts of the UK, making a real contribution. And we should value them for the contribution they make, not on the basis of where they were born or what colour their passport happens to be. I mean, I imagine how we would feel, uh, given how many British citizens there are living in other parts of Europe, making a contribution. I imagine how we would feel if they were being talked about in the way that the Conservative government here is talking about EU nationals or, or other uh, people from other countries living here. It is absolutely despicable. And that's a real worry that I have, that the right wing of the Conservative Party right now are in the ascendancy. They're hijacking the Brexit vote to turn it into the hardest of hard at Brexit votes. And I, I don't believe a majority of people, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, want to be part of a country that is insular, uh, inward looking, closing our borders and, and sounding increasingly xenophobic. And, you know, there is a, a choice emerging here about the kind of country we want to be. And those of us who want it to be progressive, open, internationalist, outward looking, really have to stand up and be counted. Well, you said in your speech, and you more or less said it there, Scotland uh, cannot trust the likes of Boris Johnson and Liam Fox to represent us. Um, when you uh, read this letter that uh, Boris Johnson wrote a couple of days before he came out for, for leave, saying we should remain, does, does that confirm you in that statement, in that thinking? It, it doesn't surprise me. I, I mean, I, I don't think anybody really doubts that Boris Johnson was making a calculation in deciding which uh, side of the Brexit argument to come down on that was based not on you know, the, the merits of that argument, but probably on what was, he thought was best for his own political advancement. Now, you know, of course, all of us, including politicians, we often weigh up different arguments. So in a sense, you know, there's nothing surprising about that. But you know, I think Boris Johnson was making a calculation that was about his political interests, not about the interests uh, of the country. And you know, if we cast our minds back to the, the referendum after he had come out for the Leave side, you know, Boris Johnson said Leave the EU didn't mean leaving the single market. Uh, and that's you know, part of the reason why I say there is no mandate right now to take the UK out of the single market. And I don't believe there's a majority in the House of Commons for it either. OK, well, we know you're overall thinking of the Conservative government, but uh, just within that, that, that narrow but very important uh, focus, is there common cause to be made for your MPs in Westminster with those Conservatives who stick their head above the, the parapet and uh, oppose a hard Brexit? Yes, absolutely. I, I've said very clearly that we will be working to try to build a common cause with Labour MPs, with Liberal Democrat MPs and with moderate Tories to try to uh, forge a coalition, a majority in the House of Commons against hard Brexit. And the SNP will play a full part in that because as I have said repeatedly, and I'm far from the only person saying this, Theresa May, may have a mandate in England and Wales to take... Uh, to, to leave the EU, but I don't think she's got a mandate to leave the single market. Uh, she doesn't not, it's not just she doesn't have a mandate. I think the consequences of that would be ruinous for the economy. Um, and I think MPs who realise that and who see that there's no rational argument for that, as well as no democratic argument for that, uh, I think it's time for them to stand up in the House of Commons, come together and try to stop it happening. And talk, me about, talk to me about that other common cause. Uh, the Mayor of London and, uh, and you have been talking, mm -hmm. Sadiq, can't. I mean, are you envisaging some kind of opt-outs or special status you might be able to get for Scotland, London, Northern Ireland? Well, I, I can't speak for London, for, for Mayor Khan, I, and I'm not going to try and speak for the other devolved administrations. I, th I think there is common cause that we can forge between us. Um, Northern Ireland, of course, also voted to stay in the EU. There's certainly a common cause in terms of making sure that the devolved administrations are fully heard in this process and that our views are properly listened to, uh, which Theresa may promise would be the case, but there hasn't been much evidence of it so far. And yes, I think there could be common cause to try to keep those parts of the UK that don't want to leave the EU or the single market in there, uh, protecting their interests in that way. So we'll continue to talk to, to London, to Northern Ireland, to Wales, um, to Gibraltar, which is also in a very difficult position because of this, to try to find that common ground where we can. You know, a week tomorrow, I'll be in London with the other devolved administrations meeting the Prime Minister. And that really, for me, is a key moment because I think at that meeting, we will find out if the Prime Minister is serious about involving the devolved administrations in a meaningful way. I really hope she 
is, but I think she has to demonstrate it next week. And lastly, First Minister, can I ask you about uh, candidate Trump in the United States? Of course, he's got substantial <laughs> business interests in Scotland. Uh, uh, if you ever did achieve independence, I guess he could have a Scottish passport through his mother. What do you make of these, uh, these allegations, the so-called locker room allegations about his treatment of women? I'm horrified by them. Uh, and I'm horrified not just at the, the comments that he has made or in some cases reportedly made, the things he's reportedly done, but also the dismissal of those, that kind of language and those kind of attitudes as just locker room banter. You know, that is really misogyny at its worst. And I think we've all got to stand up against that. You know, it's, it's not usual for politicians in other countries to comment on elections in, in other countries and certainly not for leaders of governments to do so. This is America's election. It's up to America how it votes. But, you know, how America votes, who is the president of America has implications for the rest of the world. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to try and beat about the bush here. I hope America doesn't elect Donald Trump as president. I hope it elects Hillary Clinton. I think she'd be the better president for a whole variety of reasons. But I also think it would be a really good moment uh, to see America elect its first female president. And if he comes over to visit some of his golf courses, whether he's president or not in the future, comes over to Scotland, I mean, I don't know, if there were any uh, complainants in Scotland, do you think there would be a case for Police Scotland interviewing him? Oh, look, you know, I think you're getting ahead uh, of, of yourself here. I mean, obviously, Police Scotland uh, has a, an obligation to, to investigate any uh, allegations of uh, criminal activity, wherever and whoever uh, they might be by, if, if, if it's committed in Scotland. But I'm not aware that that is the case. So I think I would be taking uh, speculation uh, a bit too far to, to start to go into answering that question in any, any great detail. But nevertheless, on the basis of his comments on, uh, on Muslims, you'd uh, like to see him not allowed to come to the UK anyway? Well, look, I, I took away his status as a, a global Scot. You know, our global Scot network uh, is, is people who have connections to Scotland, uh, who then promote Scotland overseas. He was appointed as a global Scot by uh, Jack McConnell uh, when he was First Minister of Scotland. I uh, rescinded that after he made the comments about Muslims because I didn't think that was the kind of uh, person that we should have promoting Scotland. Uh, so, you know, I'm very clear about this. I, I you know, I abhor the, the comments and the views that Donald Trump uh, has been making in this campaign. But I recognise it for the people of America uh, to decide who they want to be their president. I'm just being pretty straight in my own view that I hope that is uh, President Hillary Clinton, not President Donald Trump. OK, First Minister, great to get your views. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Nicola you. Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland.